As part of this year's fundraiser for Donors Choose, I offered as an incentive, if we reached a certain financial goal, that I would do a reenactment of the famous debates between Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr over quantum mechanics using puppets. Um, you would be surprised at how hard it is to find a puppet that looks like Niels Bohr. Uh, maybe you wouldn't be surprised by that. But anyway, that was a, a significant obstacle toward, toward getting this done. Then it occurred to me that since I have written a book explaining quantum mechanics through conversations with my dog, I figured, why not use dog puppets to, to represent Bohr and Einstein? So, for the purposes of this puppet show, the role of Einstein will be played by this little Bichon puppet here. And the role of Niels Bohr will be played by this Black Lab puppet here. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Why do you use these inferior dogs? Why does the Bichon get to be Einstein? Well, the Bichon sort of has that spiky, fuzzy, white hair look that we associate with Einstein. Yeah, why does a Black Lab get to be Bohr? Well, Bohr is a Black Lab because I need two dogs that are easy to tell apart, so I got a black one and a white one. Well, why don't you just use me? I can't use you because if I had a puppet that looked like you, or two puppets that looked like you, nobody would be able to tell them apart. But don't I get to be in this? Well, you are in it now. Now you're interrupting me. Oh, sorry. Go on. The 1927 Solvay Conference brought together many of the greatest minds in the history of physics, and it was before this audience of great physicists that Einstein and Bohr had the first of their many arguments about the philosophical implications of quantum mechanics. Einstein spoke first, posing a problem for the current understanding of the quantum theory. So, imagine we have an electron source. If we take this electron source and send it at a small screen with a slit in it, on the far side of the screen we will see a diffraction pattern consisting of bright and dark stripes. If we detect the electrons one at a time, we will see that each electron is detected at a single spot on the screen, but all of the electrons together group together so as to form the diffraction pattern. Then I see this one electron arrive here, it is then out of the question that it simultaneously arrives there. But the wave, the Schrodinger wave, interpreted as given the probability for this particle to be situated at a certain place, the wave covers the entire screen and not just one point on it. This interpretation presupposes a very particular mechanism of action at a distance to prevent the wave from acting at more than one place on the screen. Einstein's objection is essentially that the quantum wave function describing a particle is something that extends over a large range of space, but when an individual electron is detected, something instantaneously happens to collapse that wave function down to a single point for the detection of a specific electron. This would seem to require something to happen faster than the speed of light, and that would go against the tenets of Einstein's theory of relativity. When it was his turn to answer, Bohr interpreted Einstein's objection as an objection to the recently discovered Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and explained in many more words than were strictly necessary the a means of interpreting the experiment in terms of trying to measure the position of the electron as it passes through the slit, and also measure the wave pattern that it generates on the screen. In Bohr's rendering of Einstein's thought experiment, you would know the position of the particle because it passed through the slit, you could record the momentum of the particle at the same time by mounting the slit on some sort of roller apparatus that would allow it to slide back and forth. By measuring the recoil of the slit after it deflected the electron, you would know how much it had changed the electron's momentum. However, the same recoil that allows you to determine the momentum will introduce uncertainty that wipes out the diffraction pattern. When the electron is deflected slightly upward, the slit recoils downward and then is in a different position for the next electron that comes through, which will produce a different diffraction pattern. Subsequent electron may be deflected downward, causing the slit to recoil upward, and again producing yet another pattern from which the electron will determine its position. The combination of all these diffraction patterns 
acts to smear out any sign of diffraction and prevents you from seeing a wave-like behavior of the electron at the same time that you're measuring both its particle and position and particle momentum. While it's not actually a response to the real objection Einstein was raising, Bohr's argument is a very powerful defense of uncertainty and the idea of complementarity that you can only see particle or wave behavior, never both, and most physicists attending the meeting were very impressed. Paul Ehrenfest recalled it. It was like a chess match. Wait, wait a minute. Ehrenfest is a hedgehog? Well, yeah, he was sort of shortish and roundish and had kind of a bristly mustache, so it seems kind of appropriate. Oh, that's kind of weird. Look, I only have so many puppets, okay? All right. Einstein always ready with new arguments. Bohr always producing out of a cloud of philosophical smoke the tools for destroying one example after another. Einstein like a jack-in-the-box every morning, jumping out afresh. Oh, it was priceless. Other scientists attending the meeting, such as the British physicist Paul Dirac, were less impressed with the whole affair. I listened to their arguments, but did not join in them, essentially because I was not very much interested. I was more interested in getting the correct equations. And of course, Bohr's famously opaque style of speaking and writing didn't do anything to help matters. In particular, it must be very clear that the unambiguous use of spatiotemporal concepts in the description of atomic phenomena must be limited to the registration of observations which refer to images on a photographic lens or to analogous practically irreversible effects of amplification, such as the formation of a drop of water around an ion in a dark room. Once again, the awful bore incantation terminology. Impossible for anyone to summarize.